This is the best of first and last, the podcast with Mike Golick Jr. and Robin Lundberg. We're in a position where we can do something special still. I mean, at the end of the day, I'm not going to harp on what happened in the regular season through injuries, through bad losses, through good wins, through whatever the case may be. Uh, we have a good a good club going into the postseason, and uh, and that's all you can ask for. Why do you think that you have a great chance to win this? Um, uh, I mean, I got the answer. I'm not giving it to you, but I got the answer. Why I feel like we got a great chance. LeBron James, very coy, very relaxed LeBron uh, yesterday. I mean, he was previewing the new Kendrick Lamar for everybody on Instagram. LeBron's the new, like, hot DJ in the streets. He's the new A&R previewing the, the music. But he seems um content and, and ready for the, the regular season. We don't have grumpy LeBron. I mean, the postseason. We don't have grumpy LeBron going into the postseason. No, I saw the, the LeBron James, uh, the that meme of him with, you know, uh, with the do-rag on and the fake cigarette in there. Yeah. It said, one seed, two seed, poppy seed. I don't care. Let's do this. So <laughs> he's clearly feeling confident enough to... When called on a claim, he really needs no reason to back up other than the fact that I'm LeBron James. He decides to pull the all. Oh, you'll find out. I don't have to tell you. Yeah, no, you know, no big deal. I, it might be me. That's probably he. He doesn't want to say that. I guess again, well, because yeah. the last time he said that, he got in trouble. <laughs> yeah, again, gets in trouble for in his case because so many people we always and. We're getting ready today to go and go at another athlete who made a claim similar to that, although. Like anything else, it's completely removed from context. But for a lot of guys, they can't get away with saying that and us take it seriously. I remember one of those instances. I'm usually the guy that says, if you're great, you don't have to tell everyone how great you are. But in that moment in time when LeBron, I think that was right during the finals, that was the first round of the Golden State um, Cleveland finals. It was yeah. It was two years ago. Yeah, I was gonna say it was the it was the first it was the first iteration of Golden State versus Cleveland. And LeBron came out and said that we have a chance because of me. And I went, and, yeah, yeah he's, he's he's exactly right. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's correct. What do you want him to say? It's not, and he's not like a run of the mill good player, right? Or or, or run of the mill all star. You're talking about, um, you know, a, a transcendent player, the player of his generation. And so to say that would be straight talk. Brought to you by Straight Talk Wireless, best phones, best networks, half the cost. Didn't give us straight talk there. Um, straight Talk Wireless, nationwide coverage on America's largest and most dependable networks. Instead, gave us the the Koi Talk that you heard there in the open. Yeah, Koi, uh, Koi Talk brought to you by Koi Talk Wireless. <laughs> hey, I've, guys, I'm, I'm not going to tell you. I have a secret. Yeah, I'm back that, to the Kendrick that, Lamar. That was, I would say, that was, yeah, exactly. Did you, <laughs> did you hear all the Kendrick tracks that I was previewing? Check out my Instagram page before everything goes dark. I saw, I saw you were questioning that on Twitter yesterday because it was curious timing, knowing how LeBron gets around this time of year. Did he make an exception for this? Or I, I think someone replied to you that, in fact, this was pre his announcement of the zero dark 23 so we're in the clear he hasn't gone dark yet but i i I do believe last year when he was supposedly dark he was liking some instagram photos um that you know somebody uh might not want attention drawn toward them liking and uh it it got attention because he was supposed to be dark so maybe he's sort of done away with that and it's more a, a gimmick at this point I'd have to imagine that's sort of the case. It's That's all fine and good when you're the guy chasing your all-time legacy, but once you've secured it in the way he did last year with that Cleveland championship, it becomes a little easier to say, yeah, it's it's not really dark thir- you know, dark 23. It's like zero dim 23. It's, it's mildly well lit. You know, nightlight is on. But I, I don't think you're going to see the upset in the first round with the, with the Pacers and the Cavs. I mean, there, there's... Some subplots there. Of course, Lance Stevenson, his thing with LeBron. Paul George and LeBron have gone head up plenty of times throughout the postseason. I, I do think the Cavs um, dispatched the Indiana Pacers rather easily in the first round. But maybe this is a, a playoffs that's more live for upsets than there has been in recent years. Now, I wouldn't say one of those upsets would be the Warriors and the Blazers, though, as Damian Lillard did say with CSN. Blazers in six or seven. Blazers in six. Blazers in six. <laughs> that confident. Now that was that was a dirty trick. Um, that was pulled on Damian Lillard. There, the fact that anyone is running with that 
is that's obnoxious. You know, I guess he could have said, "Oh, I'm not going to go on record with anything." And I would have said 7 because of the whole Bucks and 6 meme when Brandon Jennings said the Bucks would beat the Heat in 6 games a few years back. But it's a leading question. It was done tongue in cheek. So the fact that that's a headline shows how desperate we we are sometimes. Exactly. It's the classic sports trick of let's remove all context and just go with this bold proclamation that we believe a guy made. Because exactly, like what most people's replies. Well, what do you do? What do you want him to say? He's on a it was a local. It was a local station. It sounded um, like a local station. It's, yeah, yeah. It's, I would say it sounded like a local <laughs> station type question. Where let's see if we can get him to actually say it, and now all their sound will get played throughout our uh, throughout the day on our air. So a tip of the cap to them. But yeah, this is such a non-story. It's unbelievable. Now, um, did you see the number crunching? We're we're gonna get to that a little bit later. But uh, just on instinct, the Celtics are a very good team. This is the one seed on the other side of the bracket, of course. The Warriors. It's hard to to not sort of foresee them running roughshod through everyone, um, with LeBron being the the sort of one exception. But the way the Cavs have looked, you don't even know about that right now at this moment. In the East, the Celtics are. I always feel like I'm sort of like dissing them when I'm not. They're a very good team, very well coached, versatile. You know, they have a lot of good players, but they're not a great team. They're they're not a number one seed. I don't think there's anyone that believes they're going to win the, the championship. If you look at the, the point differential, they were plus 2.7 um, on the season. That puts them third in the East behind Toronto and, and Cleveland. There's a bunch of teams in the West uh, that are ahead of that. The top five seeds in the West are ahead of that. I think Boston's kind of vulnerable against Chicago to at least a long series. Well, and they split the season series. They were 2-2 two and two against each other during the regular season. But you're right, because we're going to hear stats all day. Like, I go through the email that we get talking about NBA stats, and you have these stats for LeBron James as the two-seed that we talked about yesterday, which is that all five times he's been the two-seed, they've reached the NBA Finals with one championship in there. The Celtics as the top seed in the East since the seeding began in 1983 83-84 being the top seed all time, they made it to the finals five times out of the six times so far, with the one exception being in 1987-88, but the most recent was 2007-2008 when they won it. They've got three titles in there, but the difference is is that all those other times they were the one seed were in successive years, 1983, 84, 85, 86, all down the line there, so you have that context of, okay, we know what those Celtics teams were. This Celtics team is far removed from all of those, and what we've got, like you said here, is a pretty, by the standards of one-seed teams, even within the Celtics his- history, a really average one-seed team. If the Bulls had a little bit more outside shooting, I, I would say they-, they definitely get them, but I think that's going to be a-, a long, drawn-out series, and-, and Chicago's got the best player in the series, I would say I'd say Jimmy Butler is the best player in that series, and they've got the guy who has the the most pedigree in that series in Dwayne Wade. They uh, they certainly do, and we know that this time of year, that stuff for better or for worse, it matters. And with the Celtics, the X factor is going to have to be you know it's going to have to be Isaiah Thomas. He's going to have to be the difference maker. We know defensively, he's a liability for them. But offensively, he's going to have to give us some of that magic that captured everyone before the trade deadline in the NBA where we said, wow, the Celtics team, a little bit ahead of schedule. That's why we talked about them potentially making a bigger move in free agency to go all in on this season. But instead, they decided to stand pat, rely on the guys they got. They got Avery Avery Bradley back later in the season that is a valuable piece for them in a lot of ways. But it's going to come down to, can Isaiah Thomas and enough of those big moments, can he be the king of the fourth like he was all season? Can he shine for them when they need him to the most? Maybe I'll convince myself to take the Bulls outright by the end of the show. I'll, I'll think about it. Just that the, the lack of shooting is concerning. Now, you look at the other upsets, potentials. I don't really count four versus five. I mean, I, I think Clippers and, and Jazz is close to a toss-up. I mean, of course, the, the, the Wizards are probably vulnerable to the Hawks. The Spurs, the Grizzlies aren't great. And I think the Spurs wind up getting by the Grizzlies, but I don't think the Spurs are as good as advertised. So I think that would be my my number two upset potential 
uh, series for the, the first round of the playoffs. As I've said all year, I have plenty of respect for the Spurs. There's nothing about that. And that's one of the reasons they're so good. That's one of the reasons they won 61 games, because they're professionally prepared, because they got guys who have been there, all those things. But if you look at that backcourt in a seven-game series where these other teams are prepping for them, I just don't think they have the horses in the backcourt to make any real noise in the postseason uh, this year. In, in fact, I'd be surprised if... Houston, L.A., Utah, all those teams I actually take a little bit more serious than San Antonio. Uh, I, I take Houston more seriously than them, but I have a hard time ignoring that pedigree. And I just I see them touch that ceiling every once in a while during the regular season where you look around and you see shades of younger versions of that backcourt in addition to Kawhi Leonard being one of those guys that's starting to flirt with the line of being near near the top of the guys that we've got in this league, a legitimate MVP candidate in the way we've so often denied him. I have a hard time picking against really, especially in that first round series against the Grizzlies. Although that's going to be a fun, I said it's like an old, like a drunk old man brawl in the first round between two, you know, uh, rosters that are kind of constructed that way. But the Rockets, I'll give them the edge over. Everyone else can, is going to have to wait and see with me. Maybe they, they, you know, did something to give a uh, Ginobili and Parker a taste of the fountain of youth. If that's the case, if like those guys were even two years ago versions of themselves, they're championship contenders. So you never know when that can happen, and maybe it would look make me look stupid first. And last, the podcast. So yesterday, for no reason whatsoever, I was having an open discussion on Twitter about the most underrated Britney Spears songs of all time, and I came to the conclusion that, for me right now, overprotected is that song. Most underrated Britney Spears song of all time. I've never heard that song before. That yeah. one that just bumped in. Yeah, I, it's, I, that, that is overprotected, by the way, for, for those playing at home. you got to get LeBron to play it on his Instagram. Yes, exactly. If I can get, if I can, if I looked up tomorrow and I see Instagram video of him bobbing his head to overprotective, I'll know I've really gotten to someone. He can really affect change at that level. So we need him to talk Kendrick Lamar double album theories and overprotected, super underrated. Okay, <laughs> we'll see. If we'll see about all that. As far as uh, changes actually happening, not with the Knicks. No, uh, that's not happening. In fact, apparently they're going to pick up the option on Phil Jackson and the rest of his contract two more years of his contract. And I'm slightly surprised by this. I guess that means that Phil Jackson won the, you know, behind the scenes battle with Carmelo Anthony. We'll see this summer. Uh, I I suppose they could both be back next year. It just does not seem like a tenable situation for both of them to be back. Um, And you look at the the Phil Jackson track record, you want to be fair and everything, but there's not much positive to point to. Other than, like, it's like you're grading on such a curve where you say, well, he didn't mortgage their future. Okay, you know, congratulations, you didn't mortgage the future. What about the present? What about the, the, the near future? What about the recent past? Because there isn't much that he actually accomplished, and it's not as if we're dealing with the first year anymore. We're now three full years. And after three full years, the Knicks are 80 and 166 under Phil Jackson. And remember, in his first year, he predicted the playoffs with that garbage roster. So I have to assume they tanked by accident. And you know you don't sign Derrick Rose or trade for Derrick Rose and sign Joe Kim Noah in an offseason if you're attempting to tank uh, the, the season away, which they basically did at the end of this year, winning just 31 games. So I don't know exactly what the spin is. He's added a couple of, of nice young players from Europe. Um, but other than that... It's been basically a disaster. Well, he's been undefeated as James Dolan's meat shield, though, which is essentially what he was hired to do anyway, was be that buffer between him and basketball decisions and criticism. And so he's done a great job of that. And Dolan told us, he said, Phil Jackson was going to live out the life of his contract. We were going to give him that chance. So we probably should have taken that more seriously and see this coming. But you're right. For everyone that said, I think I heard on Mike and Mike yesterday, that Carmelo seemed at peace with his fate in the Knicks. He's not at peace. He is broken. They broke Melo is what essentially happened in here, because all season he towed the company line and he came out and said and did the right things while behind the scenes, and really very much in public for a lot of it, despite how underhanded and sort of twisted it came out, Phil Jackson and company were trying to push Mello the entire time. They were trying him all along the way, and now it finally broke him to the point where we saw that frustration come out, and maybe maybe not even frustration just as much as he looked exhausted. No doubt, and he conducted himself very well. Now, look, Carmelo Anthony, for the, the, the name 
status we give him. It's not as if he is totally exempt from any blame for what's going on here, but he almost could be scapegoated. Uh, over the the summer a little bit, if you think about it, especially if Phil Jackson keeps the job. And I had somebody uh, tweet at me last night. I'm looking for the the specific tweet. But basically, the gist of it was, let's get rid of Mello and then give Phil a chance with no excuses. Well, I don't think Mello is an excuse for Phil because Phil is the one who re-signed Mello. And Phil is the one who gave him the no-trade clause. Perhaps Jim Dolan had a role in that, but I can't... um, process that or use that as part of the evaluation because for everything else we're dealing with Phil having full autonomy right that's what we've been sold so if Phil has full autonomy and that's what they're presenting as a unified front he's the one who gave Carmelo the contract he's the one that gave him the no trade clause so every problem that has to do with Carmelo Anthony also Phil Jackson is complicit with it is I think the you talk about Stockholm syndrome with the Knicks fans who are maybe trying to rationalize that decision a little more would probably say that in that moment that was what Carmelo's camp was demanding at that point for him to resign. And for a lot of people, now you can say Phil Jackson should have had the foresight to let him walk, but for a lot of people, letting a star of that caliber walk is a death sentence for you in the court of public opinion, especially if you have a Knicks team that lets him walk and still has a lot of the same issues that they would have had as a team, probably regardless because everything else was so poorly constructed. So that's what some people would point to. I don't buy into that. I still think you cave, you cave to those demands, and so you have to live with the consequences because now those are all things that some people would might maybe want to use against Carmelo and say he's been just as complicit in the demise of the Knicks as anyone else. My issue is not re-signing him because I, I like having the, the asset under your control. My issue is the no-trade clause. I mean, there's only a couple of players that have it, and that is the one I, I would have drawn the lawn, line in the sand about. Why did he give him a no-trade clause? That, to me, is the big issue. Well, and, and I, I guess people would say that is if Carmelo's camp was saying the only way we're signing on the dotted line is if there's no-trade clause is in there, then at some point that's just a staring contest that maybe Phil Jackson lost. I don't know enough about what went on with the negotiation there, but I remember having this conversation, and that was the reason a lot of people touted, which is, do you let Carmelo walk over that? Would that have been enough of an issue for you make as the decision-maker there to say, we're going to let our franchise player walk because we don't want to give him this? Well, you know, what it did do is lower his trade value. I mean, his trade value would have been lowered anyway, but it lowers it even more. Here was Frank Isola on that yesterday with Bomani Jones. I don't know how much value he has. I mean, when when there was talk early on about maybe Boston being interested, I mean, there were Nick fans out there, oh, they should try to get the next pick. And obviously Boston has Brooklyn's pick, which could be the number one overall pick. They're not getting that, but Carmelo Anthony at this stage. He still has a lot of money. So, A, you have to get back, you know, that much money in contracts. So it's a very complicated thing. So I, I don't really know. Now, if you're a Knicks fan, I, I know how you feel. you, you got to be depressed. I mean, Jeff Hornacek was talking about the triangle again at the end of the year. All this stuff is, is going on. Controversy seems to follow the Knicks. First and last. Mike, um, this Eli Manning story, I'm interested, genuinely, to see what the reaction is to it. Yeah, what the public backlash to something like this is that feels strange in a lot of ways because it's not the usual bout of player impropriety that we're used to seeing where it's a player committing either some sort of crime or act that we can look at and say is objectively bad, where here it gets a little dicier because of the medium that we're involved in in memorabilia sales, which is in and of itself something that always feels a little seedy to me. Shady. Yeah. 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 Just a bit. Just a wee bit shady. Um, now, as far as this goes, too, you have to deal with likability. Um, you know, and there are plenty of people who think Eli's overrated for what he did in the playoffs and all that, but generally I think he's liked. He's a likable guy, and that can sway the way things are covered. So you have to sort of use that as the, the pretext here because just let's go with Mark McGuire and Barry Bonds. The level of vitriol that went to Barry Bonds seems way out of proportion to the level that went to Mark McGuire, and Barry Bonds was a far better player. 
Like, far better player. You know, arguably the best player of all time. <laughs> and Mark McGuire was a, a slugger. But Mark McGuire is, is almost still beloved, and uh, Barry Bonds became a pariah. So that shows you how likability can factor into judgment here. And Eli is, I think, for the most part, very well liked. Well, I, even if he's not as well liked, he's at least seen as harmless. Like, Eli is the aw shucks guy. He comes off as goofy. We see all the still shots of his Eli face on the sideline at certain times. So for being a multiple Super Bowl champion and a guy that's probably going to be a Hall of Fame quarterback, we generally come at him with kid gloves when it comes to stuff like this. So it's strange to see him implicated now in a lawsuit in something that's going on where uh, a mem- for you know for the facts of the situation, uh, a couple of memorabilia dealers that were under investigated uh, under investigation by the FBI for uh, memorabilia fraud for basically having inauthentic goods that they were passing off as authentic Giants gear, all of a sudden now implicating Eli Manning saying that he was complicit in handing over gear that was sold to them as authentic, game-worn Giants Eli Manning gear when, in fact, according to them, was not. Yeah, I mean, there there's certain businesses, that, as you mentioned, or if you even, I should use air quotes, businesses, where you should go in with a healthy degree of skepticism. I would say the, the memorabilia industry is one of them. Ticket scalpers, if you're going to do a, a deal with a ticket scalper, be prepared for when they scan that barcode for them to say, nope, that's not a, a, a real ticket. But in this case... Um, you have an email that that's sort of the the centerpiece, right? The the smoking gun for the case of these sports memorabilia guys, where Eli Manning says, and here are the quotes that are in the story: two helmets that can pass as game used. And he sent this email to the Giants' head equipment manager. Now, out of context is always an easy excuse, right? It's like if you can't say you were hacked, you were taken out of context. But at the same time. I would need to see the context of this conversation before rendering full judgment. Does it look great that he's saying that can pass as game use? No, but we don't see the entire email conversation here. We don't see what he's responding to. We don't see what he might say later in this conversation. So to simply take that one sentence, that one piece of a sentence, and then put it in a a, a lawsuit and put it in stories everywhere, to me, is not definitive proof that some sort of fraud took place. No, because the email was supposed to be part of a chain. It was initiated. Eli was sent a note by Alan Zucker, his marketing agent, to come up with some equipment to satisfy his obligation to provide such materials with the memorabilia company Steiner Sports. And a lot of guys have those deals where they'll provide that as, as part of that in that way. Where the Giants fall back is that they say, especially with this email, because the Giants are implicated in this a bit because they've supposedly deleted that email chain from their servers, and they're saying it falls well before any of the, uh, you know, any of these allegations came down, so there was no requirement on their part to keep it around. So there's a weird implication for them because a lot of the conversation now is based off what happens with this going forward. Would the Giants or the league feel compelled to step in and levy any sort of punishment on Eli Manning for this? Yeah, here I thought we were done with emails finally, right? But we're, we're delving into them with Eli Manning. And the other part of this is 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 this. Now, I have to, I have to couch it because if... They are, the Giants, Eli Manning, saying they're going to provide game-worn stuff. They should provide game-worn stuff, right? That, we, we should all agree on that, right? Yes, yeah, we should, we should put aside our, you know, our own personal feelings about the industry in question here and understand that this is the basis of their livelihood, which is that, you know, being able to authenticate the goods that they are in turn selling to other people, selling to fans that are usually buying these things. And we usually, you know, get accused of running rupshot over the feelings of the fans. So that should be of note that if people expect to be buying these certain things, they should be able to go in that with a degree of some degree of certainty that they're getting what they're promised at the same time. I can't really be outraged about it because this is like one of those things. Does it really matter if it's game-worn? Isn't it about the idea that it's game-worn? Like the the feeling that it's game-worn? What does it being game-worn actually do for you? So when you go into it, you want a Giants helmet, right? Like that's what you're, you're purchasing, a Giants helmet. So... It would be bad if it's fraud and all that, but of the, like the, the crimes that have, have been committed, of the like scandals that we've dealt with in the, the, the sports world, I cannot muster up 
the outrage. I cannot uh, go to feigned outrage about this because the whole premise to me is basically ridiculous. I'll tell you what ends up being a footnote in this article and this conversation, but one I can muster very real outrage over is what they talk about in the bottom. Who They talked about uh, uh, one of the guys who's in question here who works for the memorabilia company has also loaned a lot of pieces from his collection to the collection inside of MetLife Stadium. And one of the items, uh, Inselberg alleges that he was sold many game-used items, including Michael Strahan's Super Bowl game-used jersey that was authenticated in photo match. And supposedly in this, the Giants had given him the real jersey and presented Michael Strahan with a fake and told him that that was his jersey from the game. If that ends up being true, and I'm Michael Strahan and I find this out, I'm drawing blood from somebody. Because that, to me, is heinous. Because what we're talking about on the other side is you know, fans or collectors who are buying these items who may have emo- some sort of emotional value for them, but it's not something that they went through personally. You're talking about Michael Strahan's jersey from a Super Bowl that he played in and won, a very concrete, real memory in his life. Like, Despite how the game went, if I found out that someone from Notre Dame's equipment office had given and sold off to a memorabilia collector my jersey from our national championship game and I was giving a fake, I'd be going back there kicking in the door taking names. Because that, to me, is the part where I can, as, and this is where my bias as a former player shines through and all that, but I, I, that, to me, would drive me up a wall. And if I was Michael Strahan and read that and found out any of that might be true, I would be furious with my former employer. I get that, except for if I'm Michael Strahan. I don't know if I can find much to be upset about, <laughs> you know, right at the current moment. Michael Strahan just like, I mean, he, talk about not just like the bank statement he must see. But oh, yeah, the money machine life, in his basement. I mean, he's like one of the most popular people on earth right now. Oh, he is. He's he's beloved by everyone. Life, life is good for Michael Strahan. But at the same time, one of the basis for... One of the founding reasons why he is where he is today is because he can attach multiple-time Super Bowl champion to his name because he was such an integral part of that NASCAR defensive line that was the hallmark of the Giants during that era, and because he was such a great player. And for him, that's one of those great memories in his life that's the basis for everything that's happened since then. And i got to imagine he would like to believe that he's got his own jersey from that game that you you mentioned, what do you get when you're getting a game worn jersey? And my joke was going to be, well, you get a little bit of extra sweat and dirt. Well, that's yeah. his sweat and his dirt on that jersey. And I would like to at least know that in my basement, probably hanging up somewhere, is the actual jersey with my sweat, my dirt, and probably a little bit of blood and vomit thrown in there. How big a scandal is this if, in fact, there were fraudulent game worn helmets and, and the like? passed off by Eli Manning and the Giants. 888-729-3776. You know, Michael Strahan, part of that that first Super Bowl team. If I was Eli Manning after the David Tyree catch, I'd be a little hesitant to give up helmets as well. Yeah, helmets are, helmets are really going to help you towards a Hall of Fame legacy despite a regular season body of work that leaves a little bit to be desired at times. A- am I wrong, though, that it's like the, the spirit of it when you go, you, you, you want, want something that looks, I mean, that is what you really kind of want, something that looks like a real Giants helmet. Does, does it matter that much if it's game worn? Why does that matter? Well, an authentic, like even an authentic Giants helmet from in the building, because guys have a bunch of helmets that they have on, on hand just in case, so if it's one from inside the building, from inside that locker room, isn't it kind of good enough? Yeah, a new one would actually be better. You talk about sweat and blood. No, who wants sweat and blood stinking up their house? You know, a brand f- fresh, spanking new, crispy Giants helmet. Exactly. It's all going to be framed or in a glass case anyway, so it's not like you get any of the wonderful sensations of those smells to begin with. First and last, the podcast. The playoffs are over. We just don't know it yet. I mean, we haven't seen the results, but the playoffs are over. I, I don't think the the Warriors will be challenged. You know, everyone's going to try to... Oh, I could see this. You really could see some team beating the Warriors in a series. Which team? Which team has enough firepower to score with the Warriors? Jeff Van Gundy with his call for the NBA playoffs. An unexpected take for me from Jeff Van Gundy, a guy who usually operates in that very traditional coach role as far as a broadcaster, like sticks by a lot of the very coach-isms that get us through the very cliche sports moments. So the idea that any given, you know, any given Sunday or whatever the comparable version for the NBA would be going through the playoffs wouldn't come into there somewhere is, is a bit interesting. No, he throws that, that hook though. I mean, he, um, 
I, I remember when the, the, the Heat first came together, predicted they'd break the Bulls record right off, off jump. When that first happened. Oh, all right. Maybe he's a bit more of a heat-seeking missile than I've given him credit for. But <laughs> it, it, that one's interesting because you look at, I guess, the body of work for all of the great, you know, the, the now two great Warriors teams preceding it that they mentioned. Because what is 67 wins two years ago, 73 last year, and 67 again this year. So just sort of insane output from them in the win category. But the first year they got really crushed by a lot of people for having an easy path to the finals. Then last year dealt with injuries to Steph Curry and the Draymond Green suspension that led to their ultimate loss. So we've never really seen in a postseason run the dominance that we expected. Even the the year they won the title, you had a Cavaliers team steal two from them early in a way that most people didn't think should have happened based on who was on the court for the Cavs at the time outside of LeBron James. You know, I've noticed I like saying take umbrage with. I'll take umbrage with something. Jeff Van Gundy said, not predicting that the Warriors will win. That's the obvious prediction. But the firepower part of it. I think there are teams that have the firepower to compete with the Warriors. Look, I, mean, I get it. They've got Durant. I, I've already predicted on this show that I think Steph Curry is going to have a allow me to reintroduce myself sort of playoffs as people are sleeping on him, and he is still right there at the, the, the very top of, of this league. And, and I would say that still the best player on, on that team given a, a full sample of the year. But Houston has a lot of firepower, that that three-point shot. And Cleveland, they don't lack in firepower. The question is not about Cleveland and their ability to score. They surround LeBron with all those shooters. They've got Kyrie Irving who can get buckets with anybody. Their problem is defense. So the issue isn't whether there is another team that has the firepower to compete with the Warriors. The issue is whether there's another team that has the firepower to compete with the Warriors and can defend at the level that the Warriors can because the Warriors can play defense when they really want to. Well, that's always really been what separated them from the pact was that in addition to having two of the best shooters in NBA history and Clay and Steph in that backcourt, they've had a defense that Draymond Green sort of captains that now they've added a seven-footer with a ton of athletic versatility and Kevin Durant to that can check people in a unique way and has been the foundation. You always hear teams talk about that. That's another tried-and-true sports trip is that it starts on defense. And when teams usually turn it around after something has gone awry for them for any stretch, they say, well, we went back and we started on defense and everything else bled from there. But for Golden State and for most good teams, that's really true. They make that the hallmark of their team. They've statistically been able to back that up. You can point to that. And they've been one of the best, most efficient defensive teams in the league for the last few years. Years, and that's still true again this year. You're right. That's the major differentiating factor for these guys. Now, first round playoff predictions in the NBA of of the sports predictions aren't the the, the toughest. I know you feel a certain way about um, sports predictions. Well, I just think in general, like predicting is probably the dumbest thing that we do. Like we just got off the NCAA tournament in March Madness, where predictions are so futile. Futile. It's a built in part of why we love that time of year. We love filling out brackets. We love that camaraderie. We love. Everyone trying to prognosticate because it's the one time especially where being an expert or being a five-year-old picking based on color of the team or mascots all kind of put you on equal footing because it's such a crapshoot, but... In general, predictions feel so silly to me. Well, part of it's a, you know an ego thing, right? I mean, with sports predictions, obviously, you know, there's the that's why the probability methods you see that people mock are actually good because there, there are you know various outcomes that could come. But there, there's generally that that sports talker guy who actually thinks he's so much better at knowing sports that, at, than everyone else that his predictions are, are gospel. Well, yeah, and I, I guess that's that's sort of the hubris that I laugh at because. I don't need to get a bunch of predictions right to know that I know more about certain intricacies of foot, let's say football, than you do. Mm. Like I don't, I don't need that as an ego boost to go out there and confirm and say, "Listen, I told you the Raiders were going to do X, Y, or Z," but I can tell you certain things about why, like why. Like I always thought that that was more of the value than the predictions. But we do love having a win loss column attached to pretty much everything. And so, if we're going to judge sports bars by their championship rings, I guess it's only right to judge sports prognosticators based off that. And then um, you also go to your greatest predictions, right? I mean, you remember them and you'll, you'll reference them. I would say mine was I told everyone that would listen. The 04 Pistons would smoke the Lakers in the finals. Ooh, really? That was a- yeah. 
That's my greatest ever sports prediction. That's a good one. I'm still so green in my sports prediction phases that they've all sort of blended together. I had one really good one that I remember you gave me credit, but in a really moment of bad radio right now, I don't remember it, and I don't expect you to. I also uh, told my old roommate to take the Giants on the money line in the first Super Bowl against the Patriots. I didn't predict the Giants to win the Super Bowl. I wish I had, but I told him that was a good bet. And at the time, he he capitalized and got a a nice uh, TV off of it. Uh, I was just going to ask if you got a cut, but I guess it's hard for you to get a cut of a singular television. I'm imagining this music is telling us to do something. Oh, you know what it's telling us to do? Make predictions ah, for the first round yes. of the NBA playoffs. It you, is would, that time. Would you like to start? Should we go uh, conference? Should we go with seed? How should we do this here? Uh, we'll go in the order that they appear on the ESPN.com page in front of me, which starts okay, off with... Celtics Bulls, the 1 8 matchup that we've talked so much about that Tom Haberstra laid into and called the Celtics one of the worst Celt- one of the worst one seeds we've seen since the 79 Sonics that you and I both remember very fondly. You know, I really want to pick the Bulls in this. I really do. Do it, and Robin. I, I do think the Bulls have a chance um, to win this series. As I've said many times on the show already, Jimmy Butler, the best player in the series. Dwayne Wade is a legend, uh, you know, one of the, the best shooting guards of, of all time. All that stuff. But if I'm being honest with myself, do I really think they're going to win the series? No, I I think the Celtics are going to win the series. So the reason for picking the Bulls would be to be cute, to say that I picked an upset, right? To say that I picked an 8 over a 1. So if you want to put me on record for that, just, you know, give me the the footnote. Give me the disclaimer, because if... We want to do that to make it interesting because chalk usually gets picked in the first round of the NBA playoffs. But if I'm I'm being actually 100% forthright, I do think Boston wins a long series. Well, I just told you how seriously I take this, and so I am going to pick the Bulls because Tom Haberstroh is a smart guy, and him saying all of those things is certainly enough for me. But you also look at the end of the Bulls season, the way they go into it. Yeah, a couple of wins against the Hornets, the Nets, and the Bucks to finish it off. But getting blown out by Cleveland in a game that we pointed to as a pivotal moment in the Cavs season, and then a loss to the Hawks right after that, this could be a team in a weird place mentally after all the confidence they've displayed. All right, let's go quick now. Um, what's next? Uh, what's next? We've got Cavs Pacers, the 2 7. I'll take the Cavs in four. Yeah, I'm still, I'm not going to pick against LeBron James. The last four years, 4 0 sweeps in the first round, no brainer. Cavs Plot twist right there, right? What's next? Uh, Toronto and Milwaukee, the 3-6. The, the, the Bucks have some of that length. They can make it difficult, but I, I do think the Raptors are a very good team. I'll take um, Toronto in five. Yeah, I'll go Toronto. I'll say six. I think the Greek Freak puts on a nice show in the first round, a bit more of a coming-out party in a year that's been very good to him PR-wise already. And that would leave us with Washington and Atlanta in the Eastern Conference, right? So uh, give me the Wizards in seven in that series. Uh, I'm going to take the Hawks in this one. for A strong finish to the regular season for them, a couple of nice wins, especially that surprising one over the Cavs. I'll take the Hawks in this one. Let's go through the West really quickly. Yeah, this one's easy. Golden State, Portland, despite... Uh, Blazers the, and six. Yeah, the, despite the claims of one Dame dollar sign, I'm going to probably side with the Warriors. Here. I'll take the Warriors in four games. Uh, Spurs and Grizzlies. Give me San Antonio in seven. Ooh. That's like a version of an upset, right? To, to pick the, the Spurs in seven. I, I can't go all the way Grizzlies, but I, I, I'm... I'm hating on the Spurs a little bit this postseason. I can tell, and you know, I, for whatever reason, I, I just am sort of smitten with the Spurs as an organization. So I'm going to go Spurs in five on this one. Shouts to Michelle Beadle. I'm sure she'll appreciate that. Rockets and the Thunder, the the most looked forward to series of the the first round. I'll take um, Houston in six games. Uh, Russ and, and the the Thunder have been playing pretty well lately. They they've got some good defenders on that team. They make it a, at least interesting. But the Rockets win. Yeah, I'll go Rockets in five. We've seen moments where they're really matched with better teams, and the Thunder tend to drown. Russ tends to press, and I think this series has a lot of that written all over it, especially the presumptive MVP. Hang and then the, the final series, I think, is the best series of the first round on paper. The Clippers and the Jazz. This is the definition of a coin flip. They, they have the same exact record. Their point differential is close to the same. Utah has great depth. Uh, they, they've got a monster defensively in Gobert. Chris Paul... He can't lose in the first round. I'd feel too much for him if he lost in the first round. So, because I I, I believe in Chris Paul, Clippers in seven. I want to believe in Chris Paul, and I want to believe in a Clippers team that we've tried to prop up there as part of the Warrior Elite in the Western Conference. But I've seen too much, and I know too much about this team. 
And much like NFL quarterback prospects coming out of college, I've seen a lot less of Utah, but I hear a lot of good things. So I'm going to go with the Jazz. <laughs> First and last, the podcast. And always beautiful to have Mel Kuyper Jr. The NFL draft around the corner. And Mel, the question du jour, I think, has to do with the number one pick. With Miles Garrett seemingly the number one pick for a while there, and all of a sudden Adam Schefter put out that tweet the other day about Mitchell Trubisky being considered by the Browns. How real is that? How much of a toss-up do you think it is at number one? Well, it's quarterback. And, and you think about what the Cleveland Browns did last year. Had they not passed on Carson Wentz, who was sitting right there for them after Jared Goff went number one, uh, yeah, they wouldn't be in this predicament. They wouldn't have to worry about taking a quarterback with 13 starts who's not ready for the NFL. Okay, and 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 yeah, you don't know what you're going to be getting because he only has 13 career starts, and that has not worked out well for quarterbacks coming in with very limited college experience as a starting quarterback. So, and you're going to pass on a pass rusher who's not perfect. And Miles Garrett does take plays off. Miles Garrett is not a guy who uh, you know is you know automatic to be a superstar in the NFL. Okay, that that's he certainly has the talent to be a superstar, but does he want to be a superstar? It's really up to Miles Garrett. Miles Garrett can be as good as he wants to be. So that's why it gets down to in a division with Roethlisberger, who's getting up there in age now. It's kind of you know year to year to see is he going to come back and play, and then Flacco, and then Dalton. Now, if you get the quarterback, they had Wentz right now. They would be so far ahead of the game because they had a year with him. He's already came out of a pro offense, and all of a sudden now they're on their way to maybe having the best quarterback in that division in the not-too-distant future. Okay, Now we don't know if Trubisky's going to be Wentz. We don't know if Trubisky's going to be a good starting quarterback. So that's why you know when you make you know, these huge mistakes that Brent Brown seemed to make all the time, you are sitting here looking at a quarterback with the, the fewest starts of any quarterback in history that draft to go number one overall. And, and Mel, staying in that vein right there, we look at the quarterback in this crop of guys coming out in Deshaun Watson, who's got the biggest body of work of the ones in question near the top of the draft. What are the things holding him back from being considered in that top tier of quarterbacks, from being even a, of number one potential, knowing that he's got the championship pedigree and the, the, the most starts of all these quarterbacks currently coming out? It's college, and, and I think that's the thing. It's college. He was a great college quarterback who did not win a Heisman Trophy, and he did not win a Heisman Trophy because early in the year in midseason, he was just not playing to the level of a quarterback that you thought, okay, with all these weapons. Think about what Watson had, a veteran line coming back from a team that almost won a national title the year, that, next, that previous year, a, a tight end who has enormous talent back, decided to come back for a senior year. It was Jordan Leggett. A receiver who didn't even play the previous year coming back who's a top 15 pick in Mike Williams, not to mention all the other receivers they had, and Wayne Gallman, a quality running back, coming back. Yet he was struggling with accuracy. And in the in college football, if you go back and study the games early in the year midseason, Mike Williams was making great catches. The more you watch Mike Williams, the more you wonder, is Deshaun Watson going to be precise and accurate enough in the NFL with the windows being so tight? The windows in college, as you guys know, are huge. Just put it in the area, you're going to be okay. In the NFL, you put it in the area, it's a pick six. Okay, It's not a completion. So these cornerbacks are in your hip pocket. So it's similar to Dak Prescott, but uh, he was a fourth-round pick. Okay, this, uh, who, who teams passed like Cleveland passed eight times on Dak Prescott. Dallas passed on Prescott in the fourth round and almost took Paxton Lynch and Connor Cook, and they would have never had Dak Prescott. So this Dak Prescott was lightning in a bottle here. So if you're comparing him to Dak Prescott, you're talking about a first-round pick as opposed to a fourth-round pick. And we don't know if he'll be Dak Prescott. Okay, So that's why Deshaun Watson is a first-rounder now. Early in the year, I had people like saying, ah, second or third round. Now you're talking about first round, maybe top 15, top 20. So in the NFL, if you're not accurate and precise with your kind of majority of your passes, you're a bust. You're a mediocre quarterback. Bay door windows to throw through in college, I guess. Robin Lundberg, Mike Golick Jr. talking to Mel Kuyper here on ESPN Radio. Now, uh, Mel, you, you talk about Trubisky, and he seems to have been the guy who's raised his stock the most but you mentioned before he's a quarterback and, and we know his name and it's the top of the draft who is the the player since this process started that actually raised his stock the most i think it's christian mccaffrey and i'll give you another name as well and patrick mahomes the quarterback from texas tech i mean mccaffrey back if you think about where projections had mccaffrey new remember everybody said oh he's gonna be great for bill belichick in new england 
at the end of the first round. They don't have a pick there anymore. But when they did have a pick there, it was McCaffrey. Then he said, okay, now if New England loves him, I'm sure Green Bay at the end of the first round or Kansas City towards the end of the first round would love McCaffrey. And then you see where he is now. He's considered one of the top five, six best players in this draft. Okay, He's probably considered one of the top one or two, three safest picks in this draft. Why? Because he's not a pure running back. You say, well, Kuyper, why would you put McCaffrey out? Why would you say never take a running back in the first round? Well, he's not a running back only. He could be a slot receiver. He could be a wide receiver. He is a punt and kickoff returner. He is a very good running back. So all of a sudden now you get this you know, dual threat, this multi-purpose dynamo, who right now looks like he could be in play for Carolina at pick number eight. So to go from the end of the first round as a borderline first, last pick to be all the way up in the top ten, pretty amazing. And great bloodlines as well with McCaffrey. And coming out of Stanford, which is a pro offense, means you're pro-ready, which is a rarity in college football that doesn't play NFL football. They play seven-on-seven football in college. That's why those windows, as I talked about, for these quarterbacks are huge. Okay, so throw it up. It's kind of alley ball. Then you go to Mahomes. He does play kind of alley ball. He comes out of that air raid offense where you just run around. You go there. If you're not open, go deep, and well, I'll try to find somebody. Well, he finds somebody pretty regularly that's open, and he's mobile, and he can throw the ball like no other. So the system, hey, Jared Goff went number one. We were talking about Mahomes, I remember battling Todd on this, as a third or fourth round pick back even as late as December. Now we're talking about a mid-first rounder. Pretty amazing. Mahomes, they go all the way up from third or fourth round to now a mid-first round pick, possibly. Well, if you saw him throw the ball over the Skyway when he was here at ESPN, that would come to no surprise as <laughs> anyone, Mel, as, to, as you can probably tell. But uh, I want to stick with running backs for a little bit because you mentioned McCaffrey's meteoric rise throughout this process, and I, I think he was sort of a victim of the Pac-12 after dark during his college career. But for Dalvin Cook, who was someone towards the end of the season, I heard a lot of people talking about as a guy who could challenge uh, Leonard Fournette is one of the top backs coming out of the draft, and we're hearing more and more that he could fall into the second round and Joe Mixon could actually sneak over him. Now, off the field issues aside that we know are hard to separate from Mixon, talent-wise, when you look at these guys, what do you see as far as the comparison? Well, I think Mixon, first of all, at almost 230 pounds, runs a four four three, and then you go to the production on the field and you see a guy who averaged over six yards a carry in nine football games this past year, averaged almost 15 yards a catch, and had a kickoff return for a touchdown against the Ohio State Buckeyes. And I talked about that. That's pretty amazing in terms of the kind of year at Oklahoma he had. Now, is he perfect? No, he's not a really good blocker. He's not uh, is Zeke Elliott. If Zeke Elliott's a 10 as a blocker, Mixon's probably a 4 or 5, okay? And that's important. You've got to be able to protect your quarterback, and Mixon sometimes doesn't seem that uh, like a lot of running backs. Not that, not that good at it. I wouldn't say interested in doing it, but not that good at it. Um, and then you think about the off-the-field issue, which was significant. So, uh, and that's an owner having to sign off on that pick. I think Mixon's a second-round pick. I don't think he's a first-round pick. But he's not the third- or fourth-round pick that people are talking about towards the end of the season, okay, or when he decided to come out. Uh, so I think when you look at Mixon and Cook, Cook you know, had a great year. There's no doubt about it. He is a dynamic, home-run-hitting game-breaker. But... There's a you think about you know he's not a accomplished receiver he's not a natural hands catcher he's good enough he's going to catch your swing passes and your screen passes uh, but he's not Christian McCaffrey who's a great route runner and can play they can play wide receiver or in the slot he's had uh, some injury issues he did not have a great workout and you thought factor in like some of the off the field stuff so all of a sudden now you're a running back who is probably now an early, late, say late first, best case scenario, early to mid second round possibility, where Joe Mixon is in that second round discussion. That's where Cook could be now. So it's kind of a, I'd say a toss up now to see which one of those two running backs is going to go first in the second round. Mel, appreciate your time this morning. We'll talk to you next week. Your stock is always high in our book. <laughs> it's a little up and down with some people, but we'll talk next Wednesday. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the First and Last Podcast. You can listen and subscribe to all ESPN podcasts in the Listen tab of the ESPN app. First and Last.